Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. And I'm Anya, and today we're discussing the seventh episode of the first season of His Dark Materials, The Fight to the Death. Jack Thorne wrote this episode because it's an episode of His Dark Materials. (laughs) Jamie Childs directed this episode. He is a newer television director. Um, He's done a little bit of Doctor Who and some other stuff. But he's going to be directing most of the second season, according to IMDb. And uh, I thought this episode looked great. He did a good job. Yeah, I thought it looked great, too. Since we're talking about the second season, do you know... Is Jack Thorne also writing all of the second season, or did they actually get a writer's room together? I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't um, I haven't actually looked at that. I don't know either. Questions for next time. Yeah. I feel like I read somewhere that Jack Thorne writing all of season one was part of like the pitch. Uh-huh. Like he wrote it all, and then they sort of pitched it to Bad Wolf. Uh-huh. I see. I could be wrong, but I feel like I read that somewhere. Yeah. So the summary for this episode is Mrs. Coulter takes out her anger about losing Lyra on the severed nurse. Lyra and Pan recover from their remarkably cushy fall from the balloon and are found by a patrolling bear who takes them to Svalbard and throws them in the dungeon. Lyra talks to a kooky scholar who is imprisoned in the same cell and pumps him for useful information about Azriel and the bears, confirming that their king, Yofer, wants nothing more than to be human. She manages to gain a private audience with Yofer and convince him that she is Yorick's demon, but that she wants to be his instead, and the only way to accomplish this is to beat Yorick in single combat. Lyra's lies allow Yorick to arrive at Svalbard safely, and Yorick manages to trick Yofer to defeat him in their fight. Yorick takes over as the new king of the bears and instructs them to return back to their authentically berry ways. Lyra finds Roger and uses the lithiometer to find out that Mrs. Coulter and the Magisterium are on their way north. Lyra, Roger, and Yorick travel to Azriel's lab to give him the lithiometer and join in the fight against Mrs. Coulter. Lord Azriel is initially terrified when he sees Lyra, but then is relieved when he notices she brought Roger with her. Meanwhile, Lord Boreal watches the same videos of Will's dad where he talks about writing epic letters and decides that he needs to find this correspondence in case it contains a clue. After failing to intimidate Elaine into helping him, Boreal directs his two henchmen to break into the Perry house to search for these letters, but they cannot find them. Upon finding obvious evidence of the break-in at home, Will sends his mom to his teacher's house and then goes back to retrieve the letters himself. But the burglars return while he's doing so, and in the ensuing scuffle, Will accidentally knocks one of the henchmen over a second-floor railing and kills him before running away. Good use of the word henchman. I mean, any chance to use the word henchman, I will definitely take it. Um, So what were people's general feelings about this episode? Uh, I liked it, but something just felt like a little off to me. I I feel like maybe we just didn't get enough groundwork for all the payoffs. That's interesting because I thought that this felt almost like a return to form from earlier. I thought that like the fast pace and um, but like still lots of kind of slow lingering moments and a lot of fun scenes that aren't in the book. Um, it reminded me a lot of episodes two and three that I really enjoyed. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I think as a self-contained episode, I really liked it. I just felt that 
because we were missing some of the groundwork that the book had, the payoffs didn't feel quite as like they didn't feel like they made quite as much sense. I felt everything in this episode great, but just some of the overarching stuff didn't work quite as well for me. Yeah, I felt like it was a little bit fast too. I guess um, that's a good point, Anya. Like upon watching it a couple more times, I was like, it doesn't feel as fast as the first time I watched it. We're like halfway through the episode, the bear fight's over, and I was like, whoa. Like, man, this is moving fast. And then we do mm-hmm. like Will's whole thing. And I was like, ugh, this just feels like it's crammed full of stuff. Um, but once I knew what to expect, it did feel a little bit better. And the episode just looks amazing. Like, it looks so good. And there are some scenes from this that were like in the trailers and stuff. So I guess it is kind of a return to form, but it just felt breathless overall. I agree, but to me that that like breathless feeling was a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And I think choosing to end it where they did with like Asriel's horror and then relief is just so perfect. I was gonna say I don't know quite what's gonna happen next week because all that we really have left is exposition and the ending. But I guess they could put in because they've got the Magisterium there, and presumably they've got some witches and maybe Lee. So they could put in a fight. All of those people need to be there for the beginning of the next season. So. Well. If they, if they do it the same way, I mean. I mean, they all, oh, well, I don't want to get into spoilers because we don't even really have a spoiler section this week Mm -hmm. because there wasn't anything big enough to talk about. So I don't know. What is everyone's favorite part this week? I'll start because my favorite is that opening sequence with Mrs. Coulter looking over the destroyed wreckage of the severing machine, um, which just like that visual framing and like the audio on her scream is so good. Mm -hmm. Um, And her whole conversation with the nurse and then trying to strangle her and then deciding not to strangle her, actually. um, It was just like, like, what a fucking way to start the episode. Um, Yeah. And then my other favorite moment was just like a tiny little um, piece of dialogue from Will's mom, Elaine, uh, where she's talking to Lord Boreal and she says, I'm frightened of everything. Being frightened of you is just one more thing. And like, that's really good. That really Mm -hmm. stood out to me as like a particularly great moment. Is that from The Subtle Knife? Because it's been so long since I've read it. Like, I don't even remember it. I'm assuming it's original dialogue, but maybe not. Original dialogue. Yeah, they don't. Awesome. Yeah. So Jack Thorne or whatever uh, gets all the credit for that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That whole thing where she chokes the nurse. um, Sometimes I like I see things and I'm like, this is obviously this. And then I say it and people are like, that's not what that is. Or that's crazy. Why would you think that? Um, so like, I feel like she's choking Lyra there, right? That's obviously what that is. Oh, I don't know if it's obvious, but I like it now that you've said it out loud. I genuinely had no idea. Yeah. I I just felt like she was like, this is what I wish I could do. And then she was like, no, no, I didn't. I didn't mean to kill you. I'm just really mad. I mean, I think she's just a rage machine in general and like definitely a lot of her anger in that moment is directed at Lyra. So yeah, Mm. I guess she's like directing that rage towards a convenient brunette young (laughs) woman who just happens to be there. See, I like that opening bit and it is edited and framed and shot beautifully and acting great. I don't think any of it makes any sort of sense if you take it like out of the context of the great editing and sound design and... And every like if you just saw the dailies of Mrs. Coulter standing there doing that scream, I think that would look ridiculous. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you see you know, like, and, like the why saliva is she doing this? in her mouth? Yeah, that's the best part. Yeah, but but just like the whole thing, like why is this happening? What is going on here? She's just but, so but they, fucking mad. But they really put it together and make it work really wonderfully. So I love that opening that that cold open. But also, I think it makes little to no sense. Well, that's like the thing about Mrs. Coulter's character, right? Um, Especially in the TV show. I'm not really talking about the book version, but she's like 
so tightly controlled, but there's so much going on under the surface, right? She's like constantly yeah. about ready to explode. And sometimes you just got to let off some steam to prevent that eventual explosion. Or <laughs> and I guess it hold it, it off is, a bit longer. It is a big contrast to what we see because later on, Will's mom screams into a pillow mm-hmm. Ooh, mm-hmm. I didn't and even keeps think about it that. in, you know? Mm hmm. I mean, and it's also just a contrast into how Mrs. Coulter behaves for the rest of the episode, right? Because she's like mm-hmm. so cool and calm and collected and just doing her skillful manipulator thing. And so I think it really gives her some depth to show that like, yes, she does need to lose her shit sometimes. And she is a terrible, rageful person in that specific That's way. A good point. Uh, so my favorite thing was actually, once again, the title of the episode, uh, like they did with The Lost Boy where we thought that that was just going to be about Billy Costa. And when you see whatever this one's called, Duel to the Death Battle, the fight to the death, mm-hmm. and you think that's just going to be about Yorick and Yofer, but also they have the fight where Will kills mm-hmm. someone. Oh, and I like yeah. that they I didn't notice that. keep doing that, showing his connection to what's going on in the main story. I also enjoyed the the dude in the cell. I thought that that actor <laughs> had that very, very small part, and he just... He just delivered. Yeah. Yeah. I also loved the, just like the little moment where like Pan discovers him Mm. and it was a great opportunity for them to bring in another actor of color. So that was nice too. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really loved the reaction that we get from Lord Asriel, which honestly I've been dreading for like the entire show. You know, like I feel like this, this is hard to do in a way that doesn't come off weird. And I think part of that is from playing the video game the the scene where they had this in the movie is in the video game <laughs> sorry you need to pause first to laugh a little That's bit more okay. well, you... <laughs> i can't believe you're spending your time that way oh yeah hell yeah <laughs> that game is weird <laughs> okay go on but uh, if you you can see that scene online i'll i'll put it in the show notes um, that they deleted from the movie and like it's rough uh, and I was just scared that we were going to get something weird. And instead, I feel like it's perfect. Did Daniel Craig just like not pull it off or like what's weird? No, about he's it? yeah, it's bad. Like he's all bug eyed and um, and he's just like way too high. And then he's like, I don't know, like almost emotionless when he sees Roger and he's like, oh, good. Like he's just like, he just goes from like 11 to zero in a second. When you compare it, especially to what James McAvoy is doing, where like basically Roger becomes like a Looney Tunes person who turns into a hamburger in front of the wolf or something. He's just like (laughs) the way he's looking at him. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. And that's like a great way to end the episode because you think everything is good. You know, if you've been following along with the story and it's like everything is worse (laughs) now. It's unclear to me, like, how obvious what's about to happen is if you don't know already. I mean, you definitely know that something's up. Yeah, which is great. Yeah. That, that's what that scene needed to do. And it's like the perfect thing to leave it mm-hmm. on. Because of um, James McAvoy's unique position in this, I re- re- very much noticed how he switched from like, mad, crazy, angry Lord Asriel to, oh, I'm just Mr. Tumnus. Welcome, children. <laughs> Would you like some sardines? <laughs> and I guess we're we're back where we started. Right. Complaining that he's wearing a shirt? No, sorry, I meant like physically we're back where we started. Oh. This is one of the first scenes was in this, this lab thing. Was it? Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. I completely forgot about that. All right. Did we have a least favorite part? I don't like this. I feel like it's out of character with Mrs. Coulter does with McPhail where I feel like she's trying to put the moves on him and McPhail is just looking at her like I don't drink your tea this ain't what does what for me I love God and unhappiness and that's it that's my jam it did seem weirdly sexual like there were parts of her performance in that scene that I actually really liked where I felt like she was just trying to be genuinely persuasive but yeah, I wished it had been like less obviously sexually seductive. I don't remember because in the books they don't we don't see them interact until the third book. 
Like, we don't meet Father McPhail until the third book. Because she definitely manipulates him and lies to him and stuff in that third book, but I don't remember how it went. Like, I don't remember if it was kind of subtly sexual or if it was just, she's a good liar. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, her points are valid and everything, and, like, yeah, she's convincing. It's just weird, like, as a character choice for her to be like, I know what'll do it for this guy, and, like, no. And and maybe that's the point of it, is, you know, to further underline that McPhail is, like, a different creature than all these other men around her. Mm-hmm. I see that he's like, he specifically isn't susceptible to that part of Mm -hmm. her shtick she has going on, but I guess she can still manipulate him in spite of that. Yeah, because his whole thing is like, he's like, I I only care about your loyalty to the magisterium. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm loyal. And he's like, cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's weird. Um, I, I kind of don't like the scene with the professor in the dungeon. It was a close second for me. The actor's great, but what the problem was there, like I was having a little bit of trouble with it and Christina was watching it with me and she like nailed it again for me where she's like, Lyra's not really doing anything. He's just like spilling the beans all on his own. And so it's just kind of an exposition dump. It's delightful. It's as good as it could possibly be like that. But there's not a lot of back and forth there, especially when you compare it to the scene in the book. No, that's totally true. Um, In the book, she's like familiar with scholars and knows what makes them tick and how to manipulate them. Yeah. And and part of me wonders if if it was just like to speed up the scene a little bit, because it's much faster to just have him talking in a charismatic way than to have her try and needle him i'm sure that's what it probably is but it would have been such a great like to see mrs coulter manipulating father mcphail and then see lyra manipulating this dude Mm. even after seeing how angry they were at each other and everything like to drive home their similarities again Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point but you know timing doesn't always leave room for these things we have a bear fight going on (laughs) yeah (laughs) I think it's funny that none of us chose the bear fight as our favorite. It's, I don't know. I think it's good. It's just, it's not the best thing. I don't know. No, I I agree. I mean, also, how often does something that's 100% CGI end up being your favorite thing, right? Like, I think... Avatar. It's a a weakness. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. I think like having having the bear fight be all CGI makes it like a weak point for the visual medium in the way that it wasn't in the books. Right. And so I think it was a good decision that they um, made it like shorter and kind of de-emphasized it, um, and and it particularly made it less graphic than it is in the book. Yeah. I mean that scene's about Lyra. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right, well, my least favorite bit in this episode, and actually it was kind of in the last episode too, is just how touchy-feely Lyra and Roger are. It just doesn't seem to fit their characters. Like, anytime they hug, it feels awkward and weird to me. This might just be because I'm not very into hugs. (laughs) But when they were together in Oxford, they didn't touch at all. That's true. Like, not even once. And now suddenly... They've hugged like four times in the past two episodes, you know, like when they left in the balloon, they were like attached. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing in your friendships. I'm just saying I don't think it's them. But again, I also I'm not a huggy. I'm not I I don't ever initiate a hug ever in my life. (laughs) So I I can confirm that having met Kate in real life, we did not hug. (laughs) If somebody or initiates, maybe we did. A... I might have. I actually might have forced a hug on you. No, no, no. If somebody initiates a hug to me, I'm like, oh yeah, sure, okay. But if I, I, I would never be the initiator unless I am very drunk. <laughs> then I get strangely affectionate. I don't know. So they're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but we saw them drinking, and they didn't That's hug. That's true. They didn't. Uh, I agree with you, Kate. Something about that scene just felt a little off, and I actually wasn't going to bring it up because part of me was like, wait, is it the kid actor? And then I was like, oh, I don't want to like 
be mean about it but now that you mention it i think it is more in like the writing and the direction and and just it not feeling authentic to their relationship i'm trying to say this without being spoilery but it feels like they're trying to drive home how much they like each other oh. before the final episode one hundo yeah i see <laughs> just to make that emotional beat land better. yeah but we we get that you know like we did we didn't need the extra hugs what they should have instead is like one of those complicated like patty cake handshakes that they just do over and over. <laughs> I mean, on the flip side of that, Will hugs his mom and that was fine. That I totally bought. Maybe I just have like a bias against friends hugging. I'm like, that's your friend. You shouldn't hug them. <laughs> I agree that that one outside of the the cabin feels forced and like. It's a story thing. It's conspicuous. I get that a story's job is to emotionally manipulate me, but I prefer not to have it shoved in my face. Yeah, yeah. This is a big setup. All right. Uh, any any problematics? I kind of had one. I don't know if it's a problematic per se. It just bugs me. And you wouldn't even notice it at all um, if you hadn't read the books. But in the books, like the subtle knife opens... With Will taking his mom to his piano teacher mm -hmm. for safety, who is like an older woman, is his piano teacher. In the show here, they've changed that character into a man and made it his like boxing coach or wrestling coach or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of feels like Will is a man, you know? <laughs> like he wouldn't go to an old lady for piano lessons. Oh, I see. He's a fighter. Interesting. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. That Maybe that just rubbed me the wrong way. I see this, like, I have this thing that I call story math, that, like, this this seems like story math to me. Like, you want to, like, get down to the lowest kind of, like, you know, number or whatever. Uh, nobody thinks this way. This won't make sense to anybody else. Uh, so, like... You have to establish, you have a very short amount of time, you have to establish that Will is able to fight, which you can do by, like, showing him in a boxing club. And then this is, like, the only adult that we've been shown that he trusts in his life. And therefore, like, the story math on that is, like, take her to the character that we've already met. And you, it's like two birds, one stone is what I mean. Um, but it does have the unintended effect, I think, of what you're saying, of, like, he doesn't know how to, you know, that he wouldn't do this girly thing. And also, I'm handing my mom off to a, a single man, which is weird. I, I, you know, the the teacher, they made him seem very nice and trustworthy. So I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. Again, I guess it's just how they've changed Will's character that I'm a little bit not on board with. Because in the books, again, Will isn't a fighter. That's his whole thing. He, he, he... That's not who he wants to be. It's not what he's... He keeps being forced to throughout the story. Mm -hmm. But throughout it, you see him be like, why? I don't want to. Why did I... Um, this is spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. But I don't like that they've changed that. I think it's valid. Yeah. It's not that big of a deal, I guess. It just sort of feels like they're... That, like they're making Will and Will's story into more of a stereotypical masculinity thing they're like making him a less well-rounded character and making him more stereotypical yeah mm -hmm. no, I, I can see that i like that concept of story math alan it makes me think of like evolutionary algorithms are designed to come up with the most parsimonious solution it's like a similar concept basically like as few moving parts as you can use to get the end result that you need like Occam's razor in reverse yeah mm -hmm. yeah I would be scared to use parsimonious but that's what I mean <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is not exactly problematic but it is a kind of nitpicky complaint was it obvious to everybody else that Azrael was his first name not his last name because I was like confused <laughs> about why Lyra's last name was Balakwa <laughs> But they call him Lord Azriel. You don't call people like Lord Robert or whatever. It's like Lord and then the last name. I assumed Azriel and Boreal were both like family names. They're like calling him like Lord Jim. That just like, <laughs> like it makes no sense. I don't understand either. In the book, Azriel is only ever called Azriel. Like we don't hear anything else about 
confirmation Black about a last one. name or anything like that. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just me. It's like genuinely no. somewhat confusing. He's like Beyonce. I don't know if I would say he's like Beyonce. But... <laughs> also, Beyonce has a last that's name. That's true. As soon as I said it, I was like, that's wrong. But then I'm not going to point it out. I'm just going to let it stay out there. Oh, I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> so one of the things that I appreciated about this episode um, was that a lot of people, including us, have been complaining about the lack of demons in the show. Uh, and this was an episode where I actually really felt their presence, like certainly much more than in other episodes. I thought there were some good moments where Pan and whatever Roger's demon is called. Sophronia? Sure. Uh, they were like frolicking in the background and doing some stuff um, where it's like <laughs> you have. <laughs> Sorry, I like reminded that. a 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like interacting. Um, in like a very subtle uh, way where it's like if you're paying attention, you're like, oh, yeah, the demons are like off doing their own thing and they have like their own uh, kind of like separate interactions and personalities. I wish they had done that more because like the the bit where Lyra and, and Roger are reunited and they hug and I was like, Ugh. beside them, uh, Pan and Mystery Demon <coughs> <laughs> were... We're like nuzzling, and I was 100% cool with that. I thought that was perfect. So I yeah. feel like if they'd kept the demons doing that and just had like a brief hug or like a little, like, you know, where you sort of grab each other's arms thing. Yeah. I yeah. think that would have been better. Like, it would have shown that they're like humans who aren't necessarily wrapped up in each other, but that, you know, you could see their souls hugging, for lack of a better word, and be like, oh, okay. Like, I think that just would have been a more interesting dynamic. Um, and I also really loved the part where Elaine sees Boreal's snake and is like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> That's great. Do you think that was, do you think Boreal did that on purpose? Or do you think it was an accident? I think it was an accident. It could go, but he like immediately turned it to his advantage to try and put her off balance. Yeah, I honestly don't know if it was an accident or if he did it on purpose. And I like that. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Last time I, I was thinking of Dostoevsky and I was thinking about that again because he has this famous thing of uh, don't think of a white bear. And then, of course, you think of a white bear. And that's all I could think about the whole time she was in Svalbard. Is that going to be another square on her bingo card now? No, probably not. There's not. I can't. I can't imagine Dostoevsky ever coming back on this show. So thank you for your service, Fjordor. You can go home now. <laughs> okay, so speaking of white bears, like what was up with Yofer's face during the fight? Because clearly, it, I mean, it was it just like battle war paint or something I thought um, it was a scar. to make it easier for us to tell the bears apart during the fight? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the big axe on his head. Yeah. It was definitely to help us tell the bears apart during the fight, oh, yeah. even though then we didn't really see their faces. We saw a lot of their butts. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I found it kind of distracting and confusing. And so I was trying to figure out like what the purpose was. I'm just curious if it worked for you or not. I don't think so, because A, they're armored bears. Why did they take their armor off to fight? That okay, seems like the I opposite. I had that same thought. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like the opposite of what you do with armor. And also, like, we would have really easily been able to tell them apart with their armor on. Because one is shiny and gold, and one is kind of dull, gray, brown, rocky stuff. Why, why did they take their armor off to fight? <laughs> when? When did Yorick take his armor off? Where did it go? I guess it went in that magical pocket that Lyra kept the spy fly in last episode. Pan yeah. swallowed it. Uh, in my head, in the book, they w had their armor on. Did they have it? Yeah, 100%. They talk about it. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's what I thought, That's too. a weird choice. I wonder why. Maybe that's easier to animate. Easier to animate? Yep. Jinx. I can also see them wanting to make different visual choices than the movie. Mm -hmm. And they, I'm pretty sure they had their armor on in the movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can make the argument that single combat is some sort of like honor, different rules, blah, 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 compared to fighting. 
But like in general, if they're armored bears and they're used to fighting in armor, you'd think that they would be most comfortable and like at their best in armor. It's like, oh, you're like trained in this one kind of combat. So then when it really matters, we'll have you do something completely different. Like it doesn't really make sense. Well, it's like Hector versus Achilles where like Hector falls over and Achilles is like, no, stand up. I'm not going to win because you tripped. Like, I want this fight to be as big as it, as it, I want you to be at your best so that when I beat you, everyone knows I beat you. Like, wear your armor. Come at me, bro. Like, I'm the king. And it would be different if they were a society of bears who, when they were fighting, wore armor. That's a different thing. But these are armored bears. Like, that is what they are known as. Right. Implying that they never take the armor off, <laughs> at least in public. <laughs> right? Yeah, because Lee is, like, surprised. He's like, why are you naked when he, when he sees him? He's like, what yeah. happened? And so while we're talking about the fight, I have one more question. Does In the book, does York explicitly say that he got the idea to trick Yofer from Lyra? Oh, I don't remember, but I do think it's implied that when Lyra says she tricked him, he's like, oh, shit, I can trick him. Because there was a I whole see. bunch more in the book about how bears can't be tricked. Yeah. And they did hit that a little bit. They hit it a little bit. I think that's one of the things that made this episode fall a little flat for me is that we didn't hit that so hard. And and then we also didn't hit the fact that Yorick was tricking him at the end there of the fight. Mm-hmm. We, we Like we didn't hit that very hard either. Yeah, I guess I need to go back and see it. The impression... Like, my memory from the book was that Yorick more just, like, intuited that because Yofer was not behaving in a bear-like fashion that he could trick him. Well, Lyra does tell him that, you know, he that she lied to Yofer and tricked him into thinking she was his demon and all that sort of thing. So it, it does make sense that he would then, you know, get the idea to do the same thing. But in the show, that scene plays out like Yorick could be tricking him, but it could also just be that you know, Yorick was down and then had a last, what's the word? Like poof, not poof. Had a, uh, had a last like adrenaline, adrenaline yeah. rush or something there at the end. You know, you could read it that way and not that he was faking. So mm-hmm. it, it doesn't feel the same way. It doesn't come across quite as much as like Yofer wasn't acting like a bear. So a bear could beat him. Well, I think it even like, it strongly implies that because Yofer like sees Lyra comforting him and is like, you're Mm -hmm. actually loyal to him like this. You tricked me like he's all angry about it. And he's like coming after Lyra. And then it it looks like Yofer gets his second win. I'm not Yofer. uh, Yorick gets his second wind. It's like protecting Lyra is is like really what's motivating him. That was kind of how I read it at first during the fight. And so maybe that was why it struck me as weird when York was like, oh, yeah, I was totally tricking him on purpose. Right. Yeah. Because it didn't read that way when you're watching the actual fight itself. Mm -mm. It's like protective polar bear dad. Who, don't get me wrong, I love. It's great. But then they should have just cut out the bit where he says about tricking him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I I really like um, how that scene is more about Lyra than it is about them and how like yeah. terrified yeah. she is and how the focus is on her. It's good. Uh, I especially like when, when York does get his second win there at the end and you just see one bear like biting into another bear kind of blurred out in the background and, and but you're focusing on her face mm-hmm. and, and you can tell she does. She knows one of them is one, but she's not sure which one. Mm hmm. And I thought that that was really good. Seeing Lyra's reaction to it is more impactful than seeing the actual fight itself would be. Did the two of you think that Lyra lying to Yofer, did you buy it? Did you buy that he would believe her? Yes, but more because he came across as spectacularly dumb than her coming across as spectacularly good at lying. I wish that that was more like the scene that we got with Mrs. Coulter, that there was some kind of mirroring that had been going Mm -hmm. on, but I don't feel like there was. It almost made me not want to watch it. it, I don't know. There was something about it. Anytime we cut back from Will and Elaine, like I missed Will and Elaine. I liked that so much more than what was going on with Lyra and and Yofer. 
Mm-hmm. And even the bear fight, uh, I just thought the acting and the dynamics going on with Elaine and, and Latrim Boreal were so good. Mm-hmm. So when we cut back to Lyra telling these awkward lies, I, I don't know. I don't think it, it didn't sell it for me. Yeah, I think the what they're going for, um, maybe, I, you know, it's dangerous to like ever assume you know what's going on in the writer's head. But it seems like the resonance that, that they want you to feel is with Elaine being terrified of Boreal being in the house mm-hmm. and like controlling the situation, but still standing up to him and being like, I'm not crazy. I'm in control of myself. I know that you need a warrant and all of this stuff. And Lyra kind of like mastering her fear and um, being able to get Yorick in the door. It's about fear and and it's not so much about her capability as a liar. I would have loved that. I wish they would have leaned into it more. I feel like sometimes they have these really good ideas for things but they're too scared to stray too far from the book. Right. So they kind of do a mishmash of the two things and it just doesn't work. Yep. She's so, Daphne Keene is amazing in this episode at being like scared and vulnerable. And then when she goes into lying, it feels like something shuts off in her. She's almost like a little bit robotic. And mm-hmm. I I can't chalk that up to her as an actress. It just doesn't seem, I I think that she has the ability to, you know, have that big charismatic energy that Lyra in the book has. So it seems like a choice that the writers and directors are making. Uh, there was something about, I mean, there are definitely moments when she's talking to Yofer that I felt like things were really clicking. But yeah, there were also a lot of parts where it was like, oh, come on, like, you should be better at this. Mm-hmm. And even if like what we got from it was that Yofer was an idiot, they could have played that up too. Like they didn't have him sitting there with his doll, looking yeah, looking like a fool the way he is in the book. Mm-hmm. Like, can you imagine the imagery of a of an armored bear holding a little doll that looks like Mrs. Coulter? <laughs> that bear, I would totally buy that he believes Lyra's lies. It's it's uh it's been a long week for me, and I'm punchy and tired, and I'm suddenly. Imagining Yofer in his room playing with dolls the way that uh, in Spaceballs, Lord Helmet yeah. is. Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like Mrs. Coulter is like baptizing him, like, now you're a human. And then like, they're like, my Lord, don't don't come in here. I'm, I'm not playing with my dolls. I think that's actually accurate to like who Yofer was in the books. Yeah. So we've been talking about like how you were saying how Will feels like they're trying to make him a little bit more manly and um i feel like this choice with lyra to not have her be quite as capable at lying but to be more emotionally connected is perhaps an intentional choice that has to do with um the hero's journey as opposed to the heroine's journey so i think most people have heard of the hero's journey have y'all heard of this joseph campbell Mm-hmm. Yep. Seventh grade English class. Sure. This is famous. Star Wars documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Star Wars. I feel like Star Wars is what really launched Campbell out there in the popular culture. I encountered Campbell in college studying religious stuff and then only later found out that like, oh, Star Wars and blah, 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 storytelling. Because like the hero's journey is not about storytelling. Uh, it's about religion. We've talked about that a bit before. Yeah. And... I feel like the book is definitely a a hero's journey, which is not necessarily gendered, Uh, you know, like a woman or a man can go down the hero's journey. But I think that the tone of the hero's journey is masculine, as opposed to the the heroine's journey, which is something that was come up with later. And was it him or was it other people extending his work? So there was a lady named... uh, Maureen Murdoch, who worked a little bit with Campbell. Um, So way back when we were doing the book, we talked about Carl Jung and archetypes. And an archetype is just basically like something that you encounter and you automatically just have more information about the archetype than what's on the surface. You just know like, oh, that thing's evil or that thing is goodness. So... 
that was kind of the approach that Campbell had to the hero's journey. He he saw all of these archetypes and mythology, and it's like suddenly occurred to him like, oh, this entire story itself is an archetype that as people, when we encounter this story, we know more about what this story means than the information in the story itself. Like we recognize something about being a human being from the story itself. Maureen Murdoch talked to him about the hero's journey. She is a Jungian psychologist and said like, okay, I read your thing and you know, it's always men who go on the journey, you know, in, in ancient myths. And that's not like Campbell saying that that's just the myths that he, you know, studied that the, the protagonist right. is always a man. Um, and he said, yeah, of course, because the entire point of them leaving the community is because they can't be feminine in the community. And that imbalance is uh, what causes the problem. So they have to leave the community, find the feminine in the world, and return uh, more whole and redistribute the feminine to the community. Oh, interesting. And he's, so he said, there's no reason for a woman to go on the hero's journey. She's already feminine. She's already got the treasure. And Marie Murdoch said, huh, except we're not allowed to have the treasure in the male society. And so she constructed from her therapy work, the story that women were telling her over and over and over throughout the seventies and eighties was that they would go out into the world, you know, to, for careers or to create a family or, you know, just to live their normal life in Western society. And they were not allowed to be sufficiently feminine and when they tried to be masculine to, you know, fit into the paradigm of the world around them, uh, that ended in failure. And what they had to do was go on an inward journey uh, to rediscover their femininity and bring it back and be more whole, you know, to accept their masculine and feminine uh, traits and be a more whole person at the uh, end of that interior journey and give those gifts to themselves. And so that's what she called the heroine's journey. And I, what I see is that book Lyra is a little bit more of the hero's journey where she's going out there dominating other people's reality with her ability to lie, which is a very masculine thing to do as opposed to TV Lyra, who is much more emotionally connected with everyone around her. She's more emotionally connected to herself and she's winning by these connections that she has with other people. Like the reason that she beats Yofer is not necessarily because she lies to him, but because of her strong connection to Yorick and that he's coming for her because he loves her and because he, you know, she got his soul back for him, his armor back for him. And so no matter what, he's going to come and save her. It's strange how the social construct of binary genders have fucked up everything. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> I should say that I stand by what I said about the gender thing. I think that is Campbell's approach. Uh, a lot of people want to talk about the hero's journey, who to me clearly have not read the book, as being like ungendered or like gender neutral or something like that, which is ridiculous. Um, but Campbell himself was like kind of a sexist. And there's lots of problematic stuff in the hero with a thousand faces. So I don't want to like gloss over that or pretend like it's, it's not a thing because it is a thing. And I don't think that um, Maureen Murdoch or the people who have um, taken her work and continued to like scaffold it and change it and adapt it. Don't like carry a legacy of that like embedded sexism. It's, you know, a thing that right. is like a legacy of it. I can kind of see what you're saying. I actually think maybe that, that plays into just like the brief comment that I had earlier about how they're trying to sort of merge two storylines or two storytelling styles mm -hmm. and how sometimes it, it doesn't really work for them and they should just commit one or the other. Yeah, I definitely noticed it in this episode because of Will. 
and I was like, Will's story feels more like a, the beginning of a hero's journey. And Lyra's doesn't at all feel like a hero's journey for the whole thing. And I was like, oh, and Will's a boy and Lyra's a girl. Um, <laughs> well, well spotted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a genius. I mean, yeah, totally. I can see where it, would, it could not, it would not be intentional, but they're just used to, you know, the lady gets the heroine's journey and the dude gets the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of happens. I mean, I think that you need both uh, to really like have a complete person. You kind of need that interior journey and that external. Like that's the most satisfying kinds of stories, I think. Um, but you don't always get that, especially in fantasy. You get a lot of because so much of the interior of the character is kind of externalized in the world building and magic system and all of that stuff. You get a lot of the stuff like on the outside and that, you know, like fantasy has this close relationship to ancient mythology, which is where the hero's journey is situated. So mm -hmm. the heroine's journey is way more psychological, but it kind of makes sense because this show is like a psychological drama. And so I don't know if it's an accident, but. I was definitely seeing it this time. We should keep this in mind going forward because once, I mean, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that they're obviously Lyra and Will's storylines are going to intersect. What? <laughs> so once that happens, I feel like it'll be interesting to see where they take that. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to see those two actors like sharing the screen together at the same time. Yeah, me too. I, I am also very excited. I presume that they like cast them or screen tested them together because I don't mm -hmm. see why they wouldn't to see how they play off each other. Mm -hmm. I also enjoy how much they made the cat important in this episode. <laughs> yeah. As I have mentioned before, cats are important. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not just true. saying that cats are important in these books. <laughs> they come up a lot. They're yeah. I, like, I do think that that is, Philip Pullman sort of like paying homage to Scrodinger, who I just in my head got mixed up with Young, I, name wise, and I was like, "That's not right." <laughs> not even similar. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Too many names. At least it yeah. wasn't Dostoevsky. Well, I'm never gonna voluntarily say that name. So, <laughs> anyways, so I'm glad that the cat participated in the murder and. <laughs> It's just generally being fluffy and cute on the screen. That is straight out of the book, though. Yes, it is. That scene was almost exactly how that went down in the book. Although, I, I, I'm not a big fan of that trope, I suppose, in fiction in general, where somebody... Of accidental murder? Over accidental a... murder, and then, obviously, they're just going to arrest me, so I can't just stay here. And it's like, nobody, nobody in the real world believes that. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like these people are obviously breaking into your home you pushed him he tripped over the cat that is like you're not gonna get arrested like i guess in will's case he is actually just worried about being taken away from his mom yeah i think there's yeah there's there's extra stuff there that helps that choice but yeah you're right i feel like given our backgrounds i should at least mention the buffy episode ted oh yeah i mean but she actually Which did like kind of murder that robot I mean, yeah. <laughs> she just punched him. And he totally <laughs> deserved it, as much as a robot can. No, yeah, 100%, but it was obviously not an accident. Well, and like Schrodinger's cat, you were both correct and incorrect about the guy dying at the same time. Right. So, good job, I guess. <laughs> I guess we could make that claim about any prediction we have. There's some world where I was right. <laughs> <laughs> You had talked about how in the book we get a lot more of Will kind of like, you know, managing his mom by assuring her that he believes in her reality, or at least that he believes that she is truly experiencing reality that way. Yeah. Um, and and I feel like that really came across in this episode in a way that it hadn't before. There was that. And also they had a brief scene with him at school where he was like at his locker and somebody bumped into him and didn't even notice or care. And I'm like, mm. that's yeah. Will. Mm -hmm. He seemed way more invisible. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's who Will is there. That's like an interesting character trait, considering that he is like a brown person in a white majority society. Because I feel like 
it's much harder for people of color to kind of disappear that way into the background than mm. it is for I think white. it depends. Maybe. I would also say it depends. Are they shopping? Well, yeah, that's kind of where my mind was going. Um, See, I have, okay, I'm super white, obviously, so everybody take my opinions on this with a big old grain of salt. But because I sort of grew up in two different places that had two completely different, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but like mixes of people, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, I sort of have a different perspective on that. Because when I was lived in Toronto, numbers-wise, at least at my school and in my neighborhood, white people were very much on the minority. And I'm not saying that that doesn't mean uh, people of color were not still more victimized. Because, like, despite these numbers, despite many years of me being the only white person in my class, every single teacher was white. You know, every single administrative person was white. So Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they had things easier. I'm just saying, on a strict numbers face, I was in the minority. Yeah. And people of color definitely could just fade away into the background. But uh, moving to where I live now in Vancouver, there's no, there's very few black people here, especially just in comparison to where I grew up. It's it's actually changed quite a bit in the last few years. There's been a lot more. But when I first moved here, there was almost none. And it was so weird for me. Now, we have a much higher... Uh, Chinese and Korean and Indian population here. So I'm not saying there's no people of color here. I'm just saying when I first moved here, there was no black people. And it was very strange for me. <laughs> that West Coast I, thing. I, I assume even stranger for the very few black people who do live here. Right. So now they do stick out here. But when I was younger and living in Toronto, they didn't, they could have, you know, will very much could have just blended into everybody else. Maybe I was thinking about it more in, like, the high school context. Because, like, I went to a school that was, at least on paper, very diverse and, like, equally split between whites, blacks, and Hispanics. But, like, white kids could still, like, walk through the hallway without hall passes a lot better. (laughs) You know, like, we didn't get stopped as much. I don't know. There's just, like, a lot of stereotyping that that goes on. Right. No, I... I hear what you're saying, and obviously I don't, I don't have the, the experience of skipping class as a person of color. Mm-hmm. I do have the experience of skipping class as a white person. That was super easy. I just <laughs> nobody cared what I did. Um, uh, you know, when you like single somebody out, that works. They couldn't. They wouldn't be able to single them out. It would be they. They, they just didn't have the numbers. There was yeah. way more of them than there were of teachers. Well, it's it's just something to uh, keep in mind as we go forward. I mean, and obviously, like, British society is very different, I'm sure, in ways uh, from American society. Mm. (laughs) They invented that shit. Well, I mean. (laughs) We got it from them. We we learned it from watching you, Dad. Um. Okay. (laughs) And again, and it does actually look like Will does live in a very white neighborhood. And point out that uh, Will's uh, uniform coat is the same color as Lyra's hat. I guess we could. We didn't have a knitting corner. There wasn't really. Everybody's in their like warm gear, mm-hmm. so I don't really see any knitting. Not to say that there wasn't. Any, oh, you know what? James McAvoy might have been wearing a sweater. I don't remember. Shoot. Mm, maybe. I guess I'm just not as into his sweaters as Alan is. Yeah. <laughs> York had a cool fur coat. Um, so speaking of Azriel, one of the things that loved here and also loved in the book is that like when he's imprisoned not only do they give him like all of the scientific equipment that he needs but he also just gets to have a butler and it kind of makes me wonder like (laughs) what was the butler doing before he got his own lab like when he was in the actual prison cell did they just like throw the butler in there with him or did he like send for the butler later like it's very unclear how all of that well that's the same lab from the first episode so maybe he just left Thorold there oh and he was like maintaining it the whole time yeah that's fucked up (laughs) be like i hope you don't have a family because you're staying here (laughs) in ancient societies it was like 
uh, if you were like the the maid to like a princess or like the butler to a prince or something like that, and then they died in like a chariot accident, they would kill you too, so that you could serve them in the afterlife. And it feels like that shit here. <laughs> Be like, yes, Lord Asriel, you went to jail, but why do I have to go to jail? <laughs> Maybe maybe Thorold likes it in the north. We don't know. Did we want to talk about Lee and... Oh, Serafina. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. I didn't put it in the summary because it didn't seem super plot relevant. Um, mm-hmm. But it is like world building and like long-term plot relevant. I don't know. I try and keep the summaries somewhat streamlined. <laughs> somewhat. Actually, like I forgot to mention that's one of my favorite parts is when Lee like finds out everything that happened and he's like gives a good i feel like a good texan yippee a good whoop i don't know if texans actually do that but sure y'all do that is yeehaw and all that you it's just all yeehaw all the time Mm -hmm. it was interesting to me as someone who does not remember where this whole story is going what is that scene telling us about going forward like our I don't know. It was interesting. It definitely seemed like it was trying to say something thematic, but I like didn't. Qu- I mean, I guess it's just going back to the whole destiny thing and letting us know that Lee's not going away, mm-hmm. um, and he's like still important. But yeah, I just have no idea where that's going. I guess there's a chance. Like, I don't know if we're going to see the two of them in the next episode. So th- there's a chance that that might just be where they wanted to end their characters for the season. Yeah, I think it's the same thing for some of the Magisterium characters. They're kind of like staging everybody. Like, don't forget, Father McPhail exists and Pavel exists. And, you know. Well, Pavel, Pavel, whatever his name is, he, he went to the north too, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're all heading north. I really hope that we have the other side of his conversation with, with Mrs. Coulter about when she asked who Lyra Bullock was. Yeah, she asked an alethiometer question. We never even heard what the answer was. Well, it does. It takes him much, much longer it to takes a long time. Oh, ask the true. questions and get the answers because he has to. If you're not a savant, the book. if you're not Lyra, yeah. So I don't. We don't know if he has the answer yet, but I'd be very interested in hearing it. Uh, we've talked about not being sure how they're gonna f- fill fifty minutes of the next episode with mm-hmm. with what's in the first book like maybe there'll just be a lot of magisterium stuff to set up season two i liked the stuff between seraphina and lee i like the energy that they have with each other i think they work really nicely on screen together i also liked it and and we got to see a bit of hester who i love so if Mm. it is their last scene i'm pretty happy about it okay well that's all we have to say about this episode next time we'll be talking about the eighth and final episode of season one betrayal if you'd that like... seems like a spoiler, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's really only one possibility there. But anyways, carry on. Yeah, especially with the way that this episode ended. Yeah. And we are not going to have a spoiler section in this episode. Uh, so we'll just see you next week. If you like the show, please take some time to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. Follow the show on Twitter at MOT Pod so you can live tweet Monday night on HBO at 9 Eastern Standard Time. Need more than 280 characters to speak your mind? Send your email to contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com. And we promise that we will actually respond to your feedback during our wrap up episode. Please do not worry. And remember to always take your armor off before you get in a fight. Are we done?
because I'm hungry. <laughs> I mean, I can stay longer if we have to, but also I'm hungry. No, I feel like we're done. I feel like I don't I don't have anything Oh, else. no, we don't have a thing. Or you do have a thing. Oh, nope. right. Shoot. Okay. Um, hold on. Give me a second. <laughs> I was just thinking, like, that would be a great thing to put at the end of the episode, me complaining about being hungry. Oh, shit. We don't have an outro. <laughs> Or like a snappy ending line. I've been into a Texas store. <laughs> it was all plaid and, you know, those cowboy hats. There's. I just finished the second book and there's a moment where they talk about the Alamo in there and I was like, oh, I can't wait to talk about this shit. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Everyone remembers the Alamo. No one remembers Goliad. Whatever. <laughs> I, I have no idea what any of these things are. <laughs> I have heard the word Alamo before, mm-hmm. but I, I don't, I've never, I, I have no idea. That's where the bike is. It's in the basement of the Alamo. I I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, that's too bad. That's a very deep cut. And that's like, yeah, that's all right. It's a, a reference to the Pee Wee Herman movie. Oh, okay. uh, this is just layers and layers of shit that Caitlin doesn't know. That movie's it's really okay. good. I didn't, I didn't know that either. I honestly haven't seen a single second of Pee Wee Herman. Oh, you're I missing like out. I always, I always get him confused with Mr. Bean. I don't know. Wow. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> no. One of those things like, is very English, and one of those is not. They're both just like weird looking brunette dudes. Mm mm. No. It's fair. It's not even the same at all. <laughs> I literally haven't seen any of either of them. It's all right. That first Pee Wee Herman movie might be a masterpiece. It's very weird. Okay, but I feel like we should get back to Lee and Serafina. Yeah, we definitely should. I'm going to cut all that Pee Wee Herman stuff out. I'll probably put it at the end of the episode, episode. actually. (laughs)